Well, good evening, everyone. I think it's been a wonderful conference, and I appreciate all of the uh, presenters and the discussants and the uh, dis um, and Lars for his lunch talk. Um, and as I promised this morning, when we opened the conference, the sun did come out, and we had a beautiful San Francisco day. So that's um, that's nice. So it's a great honor and privilege for me to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. For those of us who have spent our careers studying and practicing monetary policy, Chairman Bernanke is an inspirational figure. As an academic, Professor Bernanke became one of the world's leading scholars of the Great Depression on the role of financial intermediation in the economy and monetary economics. He was also a prominent champion of central bank transparency and fle flexible inflation targeting. Ben then bravely took the jump from theory to practice, first becoming a member of the Board of Governors in 2002 and then chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in 2006. Our nation has been very fortunate to have him serving as the chairman of the Federal Reserve during one of the greatest economic challenges that we faced since the uh, events of the 1930s. Chairman Bernanke responded to that test with a clear sense of direction, born from a keen understanding of what had happened during the Great Depression. When conventional policy tools fell short, he sought out and implemented powerful and innovative policies to save the financial system, halt the economy's downward plunge, and lay the grounds for recovery. It's no exaggeration to say that Ben's tireless efforts were critical to avoiding another depression. He is surely one of the great Federal Reserve Chairmen in our institution's 100-year span, and our country owes him a debt of gratitude. Here at the San Francisco Fed, we take great pride in the fact that Ben Bernanke has deep roots with our institution, going back over 30 years. He's been a frequent participant at our conferences, as a presenter, a discussant, and a keynote speaker. Now, in the spirit of the Fed Centennial, we've been doing some digging into the archives at the San Francisco Fed. <laughs> in the process, we unearthed some of Ben's earliest writings presented at our conferences back when he was a rising star at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Ben, you probably didn't think we still had copies of these, but we do. The first such occasion was in 1981 at a conference held at the old San Francisco Fed building on Sansom Street. And if you look at the back of your programs, you'll see a photograph of, of that, which is just a few blocks away. At that event, he discussed a paper entitled, A Natural Rate Approach to Potential Output. He began with a quip, and I quote, macroeconomics is a perverse subject. The more we learn, the less we know. <laughs> this proposition is well exemplified by the problem of finding an appropriate target for aggregate demand management, end quote. And I'm not so sure that much has changed in the intervening 32 years. <laughs> the following year, Ben presented his paper on the real effects of financial crises, theory and evidence at our conference. It was actually one of the last, I think the last conference held at our old building before we moved to this building um, 30 years ago. In this paper, he laid out the conditions under which a financial crisis could disrupt the process of financial intermediation and spill over to the real economy, a prescient exercise if there ever was one. As you know, the theme of this year's conference is the past and future of monetary policy. I can't think of anyone more appropriate to keynote that than Ben Bernanke who will be speaking about low long-term interest rates. So please join me in welcoming Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. Thank you very much, and thank you for that nice introduction, John. And uh, I, I do have very fond memories of this area. Um, Bob Hall and others uh, were colleagues of mine at Stanford, and uh, it came to a number of conferences here and enjoyed uh, the intellectual give and take, and today also some very good, some very good papers. I'm going to uh, begin my remarks today by uh, posing a question. 
Why are long-term interest rates so low in the United States and in other major industrial countries? Now, at first blush, the answer seems obvious. Central banks in those countries are pursuing accommodative monetary policies to boost growth and reduce slack in their economies. However, while central banks certainly play a key role in determining the behavior of long-term interest rates, theirs is only a proximate influence. A more complete explanation of the current low level of rates must take into account the broader economic environment in which central banks are currently operating and of the constraints that that environment places on their policy choices. So let me start with a brief overview of the recent history of long-term interest rates in some key economies. And now here I need chart one. Ah, excellent. Chart one shows the 10-year government bond yields for five major industrial countries, Canada, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Note that the movements in the yields are quite correlated, despite some differences in the economic circumstances and central bank mandates in those countries. Further, with the notable exception of Japan, the level of the yields has been very similar. S indeed, strikingly so, with long-term yields declining over time and currently close to 2% in each case. The similar behavior of these yields attests to the global nature of the economic and financial developments of recent years, as well as to the broad similarity in how monetary policymakers in the advanced economies have responded to these developments. Of course, Japanese yields are clearly a case apart, as Japan has endured an extended period of deflation, while inflation in the other four countries has been positive and generally close to the stated objectives of the monetary authorities. But even Japanese yields have shown some tendency to fluctuate along with other benchmark yields, and they have declined also over the period shown. In my comments, I'll delve more deeply into the reasons why these long-term interest rates have fallen so low. This examination may be useful both for understanding the current stance of policy and also for thinking about how rates may evolve. In short, we expect that as the economy recovers, long-term rates will rise over time to more normal levels. A return to more normal conditions in financial markets would, of course, be most welcome. Many commentators have noted, however, that both an extended period of low rates and the transition toward normal levels may pose risks to financial stability. In the final portion of my remarks, I'll discuss some aspects of how the Federal Reserve is approaching those risks. So why are long-term interest rates so currently low? To help answer this question, it's useful to decompose long-term yields into three components, one reflecting expected inflation over the term of the security, another capturing the expected path of short-term real interest rates, and a residual component known as the term premium. Of course, none of these three components is observed directly, but there are standard ways of estimating them. Chart two displays one version of this de decomposition of the 10-year Treasury yield based on a term structure model developed by the Federal Reserve staff. The broad features I will emphasize are similar to those found by using a variety of different methods. All three components of the 10-year yield have declined since 2007. The decomposition attributes much of the decline in the yield since 2010 to a sharp fall in the term premium, but the expected short-term real rate component also moved down significantly. Let's consider each of these components more closely. The expected inflation component has drifted gradually downward for many years and has become quite stable. In large part, the downward trend and stabilization of expected inflation in the United States are products of the increasing credibility of the Federal Reserve's commitment to price stability. In January 2012, the Federal Open Market Committee underscored this commitment by issuing a statement since reaffirmed at its January 2013 meeting on its longer-run goals and policy strategy, which included a longer-run inflation target of 2%. The anchoring of long-term inflation expectations near 2% has been a key factor influencing long-term interest rates over recent years. It almost certainly helped mitigate the strong disinflationary pressures immediately following the crisis. While I've not shown expected inflation for the other advanced economies, the pictures would be very similar, again, except for Japan. With the expected inflation component of the 10-year rate near 2% and the rate itself a bit below 2% recently, it is clear that a combination of the other two components, 
the expected path of short-term real interest rates and the term premium must make together a small net negative contribution. The expected path of short-term real interest rates is, of course, influenced by monetary policy, both the current stance of policy and market participants' expectations of how policy will evolve. The stance of monetary policy at any given time, in turn, is driven largely by the economic outlook, the risks surrounding that outlook, and at times other factors, such as whether the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates is binding. In the current environment, both policymakers and market participants widely agree that supporting the U.S. economic recovery while keeping inflation close to 2 percent will likely require real short-term rates, currently negative, to remain low for some time. As shown in chart two, the expected average of the short-term real rate over the next 10 years has gradually declined near zero over the past few years, in part reflecting downward revisions in expectations about the pace of the ongoing recovery and hence a pushing out of expectations regarding how long nominal short-term rates will remain low. As the persistence of the effects of the crisis have become clearer, the Federal Reserve's communications have reinforced the expectation that conditions are likely to warrant highly accommodative policy for some time. Most recently, the FOMC indicated that it expects to maintain an exceptionally low level of the federal funds rate at least as long as the unemployment rate is above 6.5 percent. Projected inflation between one and two years ahead is no more than half a percentage point above the committee's 2 percent target and long-term inflation expectations remain stable. In discussing the role of monetary policy in determining the expected path of, of real short-term rates, I've cheated a little bit. What monetary policy actually controls, of course, is nominal short-term rates. However, because inflation adjusts slowly, control of nominal short-term rates usually translates into control of real short-term rates over the short and medium term. In the longer term, Real interest rates are determined primarily by non-monetary factors, such as the expected return to capital investments, which in turn is closely related to the underlying strength of the economy. The fact that market yields currently incorporate an expectation of very low short-term real interest rates over the next 10 years suggests that market participants anticipate persistently slow growth and consequently low real returns to investment. In other words, the low level of expected real short rates may reflect not only investor expectations for a slow cyclical recovery, but also some downgrading of longer-term growth prospects. Chart 3, which displays yields on inflation index long-term government bonds for the same five countries as represented in Chart 1, shows that expected real yields over the longer term are low in other advanced industrial economies as well. Note again the strong similarity in return across those economies, suggesting once again the importance of global factors. While indexed yields spiked up around the end of 2008, reflecting market stresses at the height of the crisis that undercut the demand for those bonds, these effects dissipated in 2009. Since that time, inflation index yields have declined steadily and now stand below zero in each country. Apparently, low longer-term real rate expectations are playing an important role in accounting for low 10-year nominal rates in other industrial countries, as well as in the United States. Going back to chart two for a moment, the third and final component in this picture of the long-term interest rate is the term premium, defined as the residual component not captured by expected real short rates or by expected inflation. As I noted, the largest portion of the downward move in long-term rates since 2010 appears to be due to a fall in the term premium, and so it deserves some special discussion. In general, the term premium is the extra return that investors expect to obtain from holding long-term bonds as opposed to holding and rolling over a sequence of short-term securities over the same period. In part, the term premium compensates bondholders for interest rate risk the risk of capital gains and losses that interest rate changes imply for the value of longer-term bonds. Two changes in the nature of this interest rate risk have probably contributed to a general downward movement in the term premium in recent years. First, the volatility of Treasury yields has declined, in part because short-term rates are pressed up against the zero lower bound and are expected to remain there for some time to come. <clears throat> 
Second, the correlation of bond prices and stock prices has become increasingly negative over time, implying that bonds have become more valuable as a hedge against risks from holding other assets. Beyond interest rate risk, though, a number of other factors also affect the term premium in practice. For example, during periods of financial turmoil, the prices of longer-term Treasury securities are often driven up by so-called safe haven demands of investors who place special value on the safety and liquidity of Treasury securities. Indeed, even during more placid periods, global demands for safe assets increase the value of Treasury securities. Many foreign governments and central banks, particularly those with sustained current account surpluses, hold substantial international reserves in the form of Treasuries. Foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries currently amount to about $5.5 trillion, roughly half of the total amount of marketable Treasury debt outstanding. The global economic and financial stresses of recent years, triggered first by the financial crisis and then by the problems in the euro area, appear to have significantly elevated the safe haven demand for Treasury securities at times, pushing down Treasury yields and implying a lower or even negative term premium. Federal Reserve actions have also affected term premiums in recent years, most prominently through a series of large-scale asset purchases. These LSAP programs, so-called, consist of open market purchases of agency debt, agency mortgage-backed securities, and longer-term Treasury securities. To the extent that Treasury securities and agency-guaranteed securities are not perfect substitutes for other assets, Federal Reserve purchases of these assets should lower their term premiums, putting downward pressure on longer-term interest rates and easing financial conditions more broadly. Although estimated effects vary, a growing body of research supports the view that LSAPs are effective at bringing down term premiums and thus at reducing longer-term interest rates. Of course, the Federal Reserve has used this unconventional approach to lowering longer-term rates because with short-term rates near zero, it can no longer use its conventional approach of cutting its target for the federal funds rate. Accordingly, this portion of the decline in the term premium might ultimately be attributed to the sluggish economic recovery, which has prompted the additional policy action by the Federal Reserve. So let's recap. Long-term interest rates are the sum of expected inflation, expected real short-term interest rates, and a term premium. Expected inflation has been low and stable, reflecting central bank mandates and credibility, as well as considerable resource slack in the major industrial economies. Real interest rates are expected to remain low, reflecting the weakness of the recovery in advanced economies and possibly some downgrading of longer-term growth prospects as well. This weakness, all else being equal, dictates that monetary policy must remain accommodative if it's to support the recovery and reduce disinflationary risks. Put another way, at the present time, the major industrial economies apparently cannot sustain significantly higher real rates of return. In that respect, central banks, so long as they are meeting their price stability mandates, have little choice but to take actions that keep nominal long-term rates relatively low, as suggested by the similarity in the levels of the rates that we saw in Chart 1. Finally, term premiums are low or negative, reflecting a host of factors, including central bank actions in support of economic recovery. Thus, while the current constellation of long-term rates across many advanced countries has few precedents, it is not puzzling. It follows naturally from the economic circumstances of those countries and the implications of those circumstances for the policies of their central banks. So, how are long-term rates likely to evolve over coming years? It's worth pausing to note that not long ago, central bankers would have carefully avoided this topic. However, it is now a bedrock principle of central banking that transparency about the likely path of policy in general, and interest rates in particular, can increase the effectiveness of policy. In the present context, I would add that transparency may mitigate risks emanating from unexpected rate movements. Thus, let me turn to prospects for long-term rates, starting with the expected path of rates and then turning to deviations that might arise from that expected path. If, as the FOMC anticipates, the economic recovery continues at a moderate pace, with unemployment slowly declining and inflation expectations remaining close to 
then long-term interest rates would be expected to rise gradually toward more normal levels over the next several years. That rise would occur as the market's view of the expected date at which the Federal Reserve will begin the removal of policy accommodation draws nearer and then as accommodation is removed. Some normalization of the term premium might also contribute to a rise in long-term rates. To illustrate possible paths, chart four, there we go, displays four different forecasts of the evolution of the 10-year Treasury yield over coming years. The black line in the chart is the forecast reported in the December 2012 Blue Chip Financial Forecast Survey. The green line gives the Congressional Budget Office forecast just published in February. And the blue line presents the median from the survey professional forecasters as reported in the first quarter of this year. Finally, the purple line shows a forecast based on the term structure model that we used for the decomposition of the 10-year yield in chart two. While these forecasts embody a wide range of underlying models and assumptions, the basic message is clear. Long-term interest rates are expected to rise gradually over the next few years, rising at least, according to these forecasts, to around 3% at the end of 2014. The forecasts in chart four imply a total of increase of between 200 and 300 basis points in long-term yields between now and 2017. Of course, the forecasts in chart four are just forecasts and reality might well turn out to be different. Chart five provides three complementary approaches to summarizing the uncertainty surrounding forecasts of long-term rates. The dark gray bars in the chart are based on the range of forecasts reported in the blue chip financial forecasts. The blue bars are based on the historical uncertainty regarding long-term interest rates as reflected in the board staff's FRB US model of the US economy and the orange bars give a market-based measure of uncertainty derived from swaptions. These three different measures give a broadly similar picture about the upside and downside risks to the forecast of long-term rates. Rates 100 basis points higher than the expected paths in chart four by 2014 are certainly plausible outcomes as judged by each of the three measures, and this uncertainty grows to as much as 175 basis points by 2017. Note, though, that while the risk of an unexpected rise in interest rates has drawn much attention, the level of long-term interest rates could also prove to be lower than forecast. Indeed, by the measures shown in chart five, the upside and downside risks to the level of rates are roughly symmetric as of 2017. We also have some historical experience with increases in rates during tightening cycles to consider. For example, in 1994, 10-year Treasury yields rose about 220 basis points over a course of a year, reflecting an unexpected quickening in the pace of economic growth and signs of building inflation pressures. This increase in long-term rates appears to have reflected a mix of a pronounced rise in the expected path of policy interest rates and some increase in the term premium. A rise of more than 200 basis points in a year is at the upper end of what is implied by the mean paths and uncertainty measures shown in charts four and five, but these measures still admit a substantial probability of both higher and lower paths. Overall then, we anticipate that long-term rates will rise as the recovery progresses and expected short-term real rates and term premiums return to more normal levels. The precise timing and pace of the increase will depend importantly on how economic conditions develop and is subject to considerable two-sided uncertainty. Well, as I noted when I began my remarks, one reason to focus on the timing and pace of a possible increase in long-term rates is that these outcomes may have implications for financial stability. Commentators have raised two broad concerns surrounding the outlook for long-term rates. To oversimplify, the first risk is that rates will remain low, and the second risk is that they will not. In particular, in an environment of persistently low returns, incentives may grow for some investors to engage in an unsafe reach for yield, either through excessive use of leverage or through other forms of risk taking. My board colleague, Jeremy Stein, recently discussed how this behavior might arise in some financial markets, including credit markets. Alternatively, we face a risk that longer term rates will rise sharply at some point, 
imposing capital losses on holders of fixed income instruments, including financial institutions. Of course, these two risks may well be mutually reinforcing. Taking on duration risk is one way that investors reach free yield, and the losses resulting from a sharp rise in long-term rates will be greater if investors have done so. One might argue that the right response to these risks is to tighten monetary policy, raising long-term interest rates with the aim of forestalling any undesirable buildup of risk. I hope my discussion this evening has convinced you that at least in economic circumstances of the sort that prevail today, such an approach could be quite costly and might well be counterproductive from the standpoint of promoting financial stability. Long-term interest rates in the major industrial countries are low for good reason. Inflation is low and stable, and given expectations of weak growth, expected real short rates are also low. Premature rate increases would carry a high risk of short-circuiting the recovery, possibly leading, ironically enough, to an even longer period of low long-term rates. Only a strong economy can deliver persistently high real returns to savers and investors, and the economies of the major industrial countries are still in the recovery phase. So how can financial stability concerns, which the Federal Reserve does take very seriously, be addressed? Our strategy, undertaken in cooperation with other regulators and central banks, has a number of elements. First, we have greatly increased our macroprudential oversight with a particular focus on potential systemic vulnerabilities, including buildups of leverage and unstable funding patterns, as well as interest rate risk. Under the umbrella of our Interdisciplinary Large Institution Supervision Coordinating Committee, known as LISC, we pay special attention to developments at the largest, most complex financial firms, making use of information gathered in our supervision of those institutions and drawn from financial market indicators of their health and systemic vulnerability. We also monitor the shadow banking sector, especially its interaction with regulated institutions. In this work, we look for factors that may leave the system vulnerable to the adverse fire sale dynamic in which declining asset values could force leveraged investors to sell assets, depressing prices further. We exchange information regularly with other regulatory agencies, both directly and under the auspices of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Throughout the Federal Reserve System, work in these areas is conducted by experts in banking, financial markets, monetary policy, and other disciplines and at the Federal Reserve Board, we have established our Office for Financial Stability Policy and Research to help coordinate this work. Findings are presented regularly to the Board and to the FOMC for use in its monetary policy deliberations. Second, recognizing that our monitoring of the financial sector will always be imperfect, we are using regulatory and supervisory tools to help ensure that financial institutions are sufficiently resilient to weather losses and periods of market turmoil arising from any source. Indeed, reflecting expectations embodied in the new Basel III and Dodd-Frank standards, the largest and most complex financial firms have substantially increased both their capital and liquidity in recent years. Our current round of stress testing of the largest bank holding companies, to be completed early this month, examines whether the largest banking firms have sufficient capital to come through a seriously adverse economic downturn and still have the capacity to provide, their, provide credit in their role as providers of credit. In a related exercise, we are also asking banks to stress test the adequacy of their capital in the face of a hypothetical sharp upward shift in the term structure of interest rates. Third, our approach to communicating and implementing monetary policy provides the Federal Reserve with new tools that could potentially be used to mitigate the risk of a sharp increase in interest rates. In 1994, the period discussed earlier in which sharp increases in interest rates strained financial markets, the FOMC's communication tools were very limited. Indeed, it had just begun issuing public statements follow, following policy moves. By contrast, in recent years, the Federal Reserve has provided a great deal of additional information about its expectations for the path of the economy and the stance of monetary policy. Most recently, as I mentioned, the FOMC announced unemployment and inflation thresholds, characterizing conditions that will guide the timing of the first increase in the target for the federal funds rate. Further, the FOMC stated that a highly accommodative stance on monetary policy 
is likely to remain appropriate for a considerable time after our current asset purchase program ends. By providing greater clarity concerning the likely course of the federal funds rate, FOMC communication should both make policy more effective and reduce the risk that market misperceptions of the committee's intentions would lead to unnecessary interest rate volatility. In addition, the Federal Reserve could, if necessary, use its balance sheet tools to mitigate the risk of a sharp rise in interest rates. For example, the committee has indicated its intention to sell its agency securities gradually once conditions warrant. The committee also noted, however, that the pace of sales could be adjusted up or down in response to material changes in the economic outlook or in financial conditions. In particular, adjustments to the pace or timing of asset sales could be used under some circumstances to dampen excessively sharp adjustments in longer term interest rates. So let me finish with some thoughts on balancing the risks we face in the current challenging economic environment at a time when our main policy tool, the federal funds rate, is near its effective lower bound. On the one hand, the Fed's dual mandate has led us to provide strong support for the recovery, both to promote maximum employment and to keep inflation from falling below our price stability objective. One purpose of this support is to prompt a return to the productive risk taking that is essential to robust growth and to getting the unemployed back to work. On the other hand, we must be mindful of the possibility that sustained periods of low interest rates and highly accommodative policy could lead to excessive risk taking in some financial markets. The balance here is not an easy one to strike. While the recent crisis is vivid testament to the costs of ill-judged risk taking, we must also be aware of the constraints posed by the present state of the economy. In light of the moderate pace of the recovery and the continued high level of economic slack, dialing back accommodation with the goal of deterring excessive risk taking in some areas poses its own risk to growth, price stability, and thus ultimately to financial stability. Indeed, as I noted, a premature removal of accommodation could, by slowing the economy, perversely serve to extend the period of low long-term rates. For these reasons, we are responding to financial stability concerns with the multi-pronged approach I summarized a moment ago, which relies primarily on monitoring, supervision and regulation, and communication. We will, however, be evaluating these issues carefully and on an ongoing basis. We will be alert for any developments that pose risks to the achievement of the Federal Reserve's mandated objectives of price stability and maximum employment, and we will, of course, remain prepared to use all of our tools as needed to address any such developments. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Chairman Bernanke? Chart three, take the. Oh, mic. Sorry, wondering about chart three. I was actually surprised to see that the U.S. real rate is about what it is for Japan, and does that worry you, given Japan's history at all? Well, these are different markets and different instruments, um, and remember that the indexed uh, real yields contain some elements of term premium. The, the the indexed bonds don't separate out the term premium. You got part of nominal and, and term premiums in those, in those numbers. But that being said, uh, what, it, what is evident from that uh, chart is that 10-year uh, real returns are quite low across all the major industrial countries. And uh, that suggests the commonality of, of this slow recovery across, across all these different countries. Japan has been in this position for a while. Japan has been in this position for a while, right? And it's like now we're going to the same position. That's kind of what bothered me. Mm -hmm. Well, again, they're not exactly comparable, but as I, I, I use that uh, chart just to show uh, the international analog to the previous chart, which showed expected real rates over the next 10 years for the United States, which is also basically about zero. So, yeah, very similar. Yep. Your mic. Take the mic. So, Earlier this week, I was rereading this the speech you gave at Milton Friedman's birthday party in 2002. Uh -huh. And 
there, one of the things you high emphasize was... Uh, Do you always uh, go back and read my speeches? And <laughs> well, I, I was... Uh, I, we're working on the historical website, oh, okay. so I'm reading your speeches to, uh, for that. But um, you, you emphasize that in 1928 and 1929, the, the Fed chairman then and the, and the, the governors and presidents had, had, were, were discussing the similar issue, how their interest, whether they should use interest rates or regulation or moral suasion mm -hmm. to, to influence risk-taking by commercial banks and other financial institutions. And so... I was wondering, has the experience that you've gone through in the last few years as chairman kind of influenced the way you viewed the the 1930s, or, or how has the 19 the, your, your your previous research on the 1930s interest, influenced the way you view the, the the current policies? Well, with respect to the, the narrow question that you asked, um, as I talked about in that speech, what the Federal Reserve did in the late 1920s was tighten monetary policy with the express goal of ending speculation in the stock market, and as I said kind of wryly in the speech, they succeeded. Um, <laughs> which, which has raised, which is the issue, which is that monetary policy can be, a, you know, can be a relatively blunt tool for addressing, you know, problems in a given market. And they didn't really have the supervisory regulatory tools at that time, to my knowledge, um, which would have been the first thing to try, I would, I would think. But in any case, um, more broadly, I, you know, I've talked a lot about um, the linkages between the Depression and more recent episode, and I, and I think the two basic lessons which I took from the Great Depression were first, uh, monetary policy needs to be accommodative and not tight, and you need to be careful about confusing low nominal interest rates with easy policy, which was a mistake that was made in the 30s. Low nominal interest rates don't necessarily mean that policy is all that easy. Um, and the second uh, issue, or the second lesson, uh, very broadly speaking, was um, the importance of financial stability. There was a global financial crisis in the 30s. Uh, it began most obviously in 31 in Austria, but it spread around the world. Uh, there were also, of course, exchange rate crises as well as banking crises. Um, and that was highly destructive, uh, both through monetary means and also through some of my early work suggested also through through the credit markets. Um, so the basic structure of our response to the crisis was first um, using budget style lender of last resort approaches to try to stabilize the financial system, and then secondly using uh, Friedman-esque uh, monetary responsiveness to um, try and help the economy recover. Mr. Chairman, I have a difficult question for you. How do you think the nationals will do this year? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a statistical guy, so I think Las Vegas has got to make the one <laughs> for the series. So I think they'll do well. Bob, here. Mike. Bob Hall. All right, so, so you pay 25 basis points on reserves? for reasons I can't begin to understand. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Central Bank of Denmark uh, charges 20 basis points mm -hmm. for the privilege of uh, placing reserves at the Central Bank. Mm -hmm. So you could give a 45 basis point kick to the economy, which I think most models would suggest would be quite material. Um, and to the extent your answer uh, is saying you want to keep money market funds alive, and I'd like to understand why there aren't better ways of doing that or whether it's important to keep them alive. Well, this is a question that's come up periodically, and we continue to discuss it periodically. Um, our sense is, first of all, it isn't 25 basis points. The, the federal funds rate is about 12 basis points or something like that. And, um, you know, cutting the IOER to zero would probably basically get a seven or eight basis points on the federal funds rate, which of course is much less on longer term rates. So it isn't a lot. Oh, wait, one second, I'll let you, I'll let you. Um, the experience from some other countries like Japan, for example, has been that with essentially zero short term interest rates, that not only money markets, but you know, specifically the federal funds market, which is one which we use not only for um, is important not only for its function in the economy, but also as an indicator of monetary policy, tend to dry up and tend not to be very active. And it seems like 
Um, we've been able to get, through other me mechanisms, communication and asset purchase, we've been able to get the additional uh, effect. But I, I recognize that there are... The more the better, right? Yes. So, so first of all, I think that the IOR itself is important because uh, if you if you look at the basic logic of, of expansionary monetary policy, uh, it, we used to teach that because reserves earned much less than market rates, if you pushed reserves into banks, they would try to get rid of them as hot potatoes, right? That's mm -hmm. that's econ one. Um, now we've reversed the sign of that because they get 25 basis points on their reserves, so they're dead potatoes. They want to hang on to them as much as so they can, and that, that if, if the old theory was right, the new theory must be right that it's inhibiting bank activities on the funding side. Whatever benefits you're providing on, on, the, on your investment side, the funding side, seems to be contractionary because of the 25 basis points. Well, they still have incentive to make any kind of investment or loan that pays 25 or really less uh, basis points. But the, the reason, there's no deep reason other than what I've told you, which is concerns about the effect on the functioning of, of markets. We've been, we've, we've been concerned about that in other contexts, in the context of asset purchases as well, for example. Um, but that's the only answer I have. But, but you, you, the T-bill market would tell you what's going on in, in short-term rates, right? You don't, need, you don't need the Fed funds market. That actually has gone negative. Uh, exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so all the more important. All right, thank you. Uh, ben, I wanted to uh, probe your um, second chart. Uh, this picture of the decomposition of stable mm -hmm. expected inflation is kind of comforting. I, I remember the 2008 episode differently with the inflation index yields rising to almost the level of nominal yields, suggesting that inflationary expectations were actually quite volatile, declined very sharply. Now, if inflationary expectations move very sharply sometimes, you may wor be more worried about that in the future. So I'm, I'm a bit concerned about that smoothness in the chart. Um, sorry, it's a technical question. Well, if you compare it to the, um, I think, chart three, which shows the inflation indexed, you'll see, well, that's the real side, but you'll see the big movement in 2008, 2009. Um, the, um, uh, the, the different liquidity of uh, tips, inflation index securities versus unindexed bonds meant that there was a, 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 a big drop in the demand for index bonds relative to unindexed bonds during the most intense part of the crisis. And so you got these big movements in the break even. But the chart two is based on a, um, you know, a term structure model which looks at historical data and, and tries to decompose the nominal total yield into these components, and it finds a very stable inflation expectation. So the difference comes from the fact that the, the break-evens were reflecting presumably sharp changes in liquidity premia associated with the tips. And, and what, the, what the, an, an, the analysis in chart two is showing is that that didn't really reflect big changes in inflation expectation, not long-term inflation expectations, but rather just changes in the relative demand for these two different kinds of bonds. Um, in chart four, you give some uh, alternative 10-year Treasury yield forecasts, and the FOMC has also provided um, forecasts of the funds rate, um, forward guidance on the funds rate, and that's often called a, an unconventional policy. I was wondering if you think that's uh, true going forward. I was wondering if you could give some forward guidance on forward guidance. So <laughs> do you think that is a, a technique in, in your own mind that, that uh, it will, would prove useful um, all the time? Well, after what Lars Svensson said at lunch, what else can we do? I mean, <laughs> uh, I think, I, I do think that um, uh, providing information about the future path of policy uh, could be useful, probably would be useful um, under even, you know, normal circumstances, not like uh, the current situation. Um, even, you know, uh, even uh, a Taylor Rule type uh, approach in a stable stationary situation might work. But um, th the short answer to your question is yes, I think that we need to keep providing information about how we expect the economy to evolve, which the SCP, the Survey of Economic Projections, was done, of course, before the crisis. 
And there we were showing how we thought the economy would evolve, but we didn't at that point have the interest rate. That interest rate forecast is now part of the survey of economic projections as well. So the answer to your question is I think it would be a, a useful thing to keep. I have a question. Um, okay. One of the things that uh, you studied the Great Depression, you learned uh, a lot from the Great Depression. What, what's, I want to get a forecast from you <laughs> about 50 years from now. Economists, what will be the lessons from the global financial crisis uh, for them? Well, I think, um, you know, we're still learning what those lessons are. I think um, uh, it was a very interesting paper today we had about, you know, modeling uh, financial crises and their effects on the economy. Um, I think that uh, regulatory problems were certainly a big part of it. Um, uh, there were a lot of important gaps in our supervision and regulation. I say our, I mean our country's oversight of the financial system. Um, we didn't understand fully um, all aspects of the, uh, the shadow banking system, for example. So that, I think that was very important. And um, uh, comments were also made about adaptive learning and other non-rational types of um, forecasting. Uh, I think we have a lot to do. To, to do as economists to understand how assets like housing can become, you know, significantly mispriced uh, over a period. So uh, th those are two areas I think that we need to understand better as economists. Um, in many ways, let me just say one more thing though, in, in many ways, in retrospect, the crisis was a normal crisis in that it had a run, it had a run on the banking system, a collapse of credit and money, and all those things that, that, I mean, in many ways, it was analogous to things that happened in the 19th century. It's just that the institutional framework in which it occurred was a much more complex and uh, much more complex framework. And so the, the idea of a run didn't occur from retail depositors. It occurred in a very different kind of market context. Well, thank you very much, and I, I appreciate that. And please join me in thanking the chairman.